Welcome to the Hoosier Environmental Council's monthly online workshops. This is Jesse Carbonda, Director of the Hoosier Environmental Council. The intent of our monthly workshops is to, in conjunction with partners whenever we can, raise the profile of pressing environmental issues facing Indiana, as well as opportunities to build a cleaner, more prosperous state. Our next workshop is on Thursday, August 29th at noon Eastern Standard Time and will be called Retrofits and Renewables, focused on legislation to make renewable energy and energy efficiency more affordable for Hoosiers. Let me make a quick comment about our webinar today and then talk a little bit about our logistics. Today's topic will be about environmental justice. It's a topic of relevance across the state but especially so in Lake County in the northwestern corner of Indiana, which has a number of concerning environmental indicators. We're pleased that our speaker today will be Kim Ferraro, HEC's staff attorney. Kim has devoted her legal career to helping low-income communities across Indiana, from Elkhart to Stark to Wayne to Rush to Sullivan and to Porter County. Porter County throughout the state, in other words, dedicated to helping low-income communities achieve true environmental justice. Before I turn the conversation over to Kim, a brief note on some logistics. If you're having any technical issues or if you have any questions, please note them in the box that you see on your screen, the question box that you see on your screen. And feel free to pose questions about Kim's commentary throughout this webinar. If you're interested in tweeting about this webinar and the comments on it, please use the hashtag IN-EJ. If you have any fuller comments about this webinar or questions about HEC in general, please email us at comments at hecweb.org. And uh, before we conclude the webinar, we'll have 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. And our hope is that the webinar will be uploaded tomorrow and viewable on our YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com forward slash HEC web one. And with that, let me turn over our webinar to our speaker, Kim Ferraro. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm really happy to be talking about this uh, topic today. It's one that is um, uh, near and dear to my heart as a, as a passion to be helping uh, people who um, have minimal access to our legal and political system and who are uh, truly suffering from overburdens of um, our uh, polluting economy at this point um, uh, with no real means to address it. And uh, we are, as Jesse mentioned, going to be focused on um, communities in Lake County, but I did uh, want to mention that that isn't to diminish other communities throughout Indiana um, who are also suffering, and, and we at HEC certainly do recognize that. Um, it's just that these communities um, have uh, such a heavy concentration of industry, as I will be talking about, and such um, a pollution burden that um, they do provide a, a very good example for discussing this, this important issue. So let's start with um, defining and understanding what environmental justice really is. There are lots of definitions of what environmental justice is and isn't, um, but I, I picked the one that um, has been drafted by the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency and it, and it reads as on your screen, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. The second piece of EPA's definition reads that environmental justice will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. So dissecting that pretty long um, definition, I think we can break it down into essentially three standards of equality, three prongs. One being equal protection under environmental laws, two being equal uh, protection from pollution burdens, 
and then three, equal access or participation in environmental decision making. And we're going to talk about each of those three. But before we do, um, I want to point out that, first of all, these two pictures are from uh, the communities of Gary Hammond and East Chicago, um, and they certainly do draw the distinction um, or, or bring home the point, I think, of a children's playground with the BP oil refinery and smoke in the background, as well as communities with uh, large steel mills in the background um, and their uh, polluting air emissions. Um, but truly, in EPA's standard of environmental justice has not been realized for the low-income and minority communities all over the country, um, but this is especially true in Gary Hammond and East Chicago. Little statistics about this area about, um, that, that helps define this as a true EJ community. Um, these three towns are located in the northwest corner of Lake County on the shores of Lake Michigan home to 187,000 people. According to the recent census data, African Americans and Latinos make up a significantly larger portion of the populations of these communities as compared to the state or nation as a whole. And you can see on the graph here, um, the United States has a 28.9% African American and Latino population. Indiana is at 15.1% African American and Latino populations compared to the three communities of Hammond, Gary, and East Chicago at 56.6%, 89.9%, and 93.8% respectively. So very large um, racial and ethnic minority communities in this area. Also, these mostly minority communities are among the poorest in the state. While Indiana has the sixth highest poverty rate in the nation at 13.5%, poverty rates in Gary, Hammond, and East Chicago are dramatically higher at 32.6%, 21%, and 32.2% respectively. So we know that these communities have large minority populations living in uh, true extreme poverty. But how can we then claim that they suffer from true environmental injustice when Indiana, which is mostly white, as I pointed out before, is considered one of the most polluted states in the nation? Um, in fact, we've got the highest number of coal ash dumps in the nation. The majority of those are deemed high hazard by um, US EPA. We're fourth in the nation for mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. We're in the top five states for the most toxic emissions from power plants. We're also in the top five in our carbon dioxide emissions, and we lead the nation for the most toxic discharges to waterways. So Indiana's environmental state is bad, but the picture in Gary Hammond and East Chicago is, is much more grim. In these communities, residents are exposed to pollution from the largest concentration of heavy industrial land use and activity in the entire state. This small 80 square mile area is home to three of the nation's largest integrated steel mills, one of the world's largest oil refineries, several coal-fired power plants, and countless industrial facilities including smelters, toxic recyclers, chemical companies, and manufacturing facilities. In fact, there are 52 Circular or Superfund sites, 423 hazardous waste sites, more than 460 underground storage tanks, or USTs, three wastewater treatment works, and 15 combined sewer overflows, or CSOs. We also know that the Grand Calumet River receives about 90% of its flow from industrial and municipal discharges. In, two th in 2010 alone, industries reported discharging more than 2 million pounds of developmental, reproductive, and cancer-causing toxicants into the river's watershed, which includes Lake Michigan. To make matters worse, Lake County's CSOs, or combined sewer overflows, spew 11 billion gallons a year of raw sewage and wastewater into the Gra Grand Calumet River. And after years of seepage and successive spills from the leaking underground storage tanks, there is at least 16.8 million gallons of oil that now float on top of groundwater beneath the area. 
Air quality in some areas <clears throat> is among the worst in the nation. A 2009 study by John Hopkins University found that air quality outside of schools in East Chicago and Gary exposed children to higher levels of airborne toxins, including a variety of metals, combustion byproducts, and volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, than anywhere else in the United States. The EPA estimates that residents in this area are breathing air that is so polluted that it exposes residents to the eighth highest risk of cancer in the nation. This risk is 609 in 1 million, which is nearly 17 times the national average of 36 in 1 million. This isn't a theoretical risk either. According to Indiana State Cancer Registry, Lake County's cancer rate is significantly higher than that of the state as a whole and dramatically higher than the U.S. cancer rate. This extreme level of air pollution is really disturbing um, considering well-documented evidence that children are particularly vulnerable to the damaging effects of air pollution because their lungs are growing and their innate defenses against inhaled pollutants can be impaired. Unfortunately, this is clearly the case for children in Lake County where the overall hospitalization rate for asthma is the highest in the state and even higher among children under age five. So we know that at least two prongs of EPA's definition of environmental justice has not been realized for the poor and minority residents of Gary Hammond and East Chicago. To remind you of those two prongs, that would be equal protection under environmental laws and equal protection from pollution. But what about the third prong? Equal protection are equal access and participation in environmental decision making. That's really what I'm going to dive into in more detail um, for the rest of the webinar because understanding the root causes of how this environmental injustice happen helps us um, focus our attentions on how we can address it. So how did it happen? Well, we know for generations that racism and poverty have not only prevented poor and minorities uh, from having a say in land use zoning and environmental permitting decisions that impact their lives, but have also prevented them from moving to nicer, more affluent neighborhoods. So I'm going to talk first about the role of racism. Going back just 100 years in Gary's history, we know that the city was built around the steel industry, where mostly white immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe were attracted by thousands of new jobs. Just like other urbanized African Americans in the U.S., those that lived in Gary in the early 1900s lived in neighborhoods that, on average, were close to 90% white. Given that the U.S. population as a whole was 88% white, city-dwelling African Americans were integrated into white neighborhoods at a rate almost identical to their proportion of the population. These photos here are actually in Gary. Um, one shows a large community of white school children going to the Gary Public Library, um, showing the um, immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe were working in the steel mills, and then interestingly, um, a community garden um, growing in the backyard uh, down at your bottom right. So this was not always an environmental justice community just 100 years ago. What happened to change Gary from a city with mostly white residents to one with mostly African Americans and Latinos in just 100 years? The answer, is complex, but zoning law, which is the common law idea intended to prevent factories from being built in residential neighborhoods out of the recognition that nuisance law is not adequate to protect public health and safety and welfare from encroachment of heavy industry played a, a huge role. Going back to the 1926 Supreme Court case of Euclid v. Ambr Ambler Realty, Zoning law was held not to unconstitutionally infringe on individual property rights under the state's police power. More importantly, though, for the question of environmental justice, the Supreme Court in Euclid also sanctioned the use of zoning as a means to exclude minorities from middle and upper class neighborhoods. Um, the quote here is Judge Westenaver in the um, uh, trial court decision, and, and I think it's worth reading. He writes, the blighting of property values and the congesting of population whenever the colored or certain foreign races invade a residential section are so well known as to be within the judicial cognizance. 
In other words, equating um, colored and certain foreign races to being a nuisance. Um, so sanctioning the use of zoning law um, to keep these populations out of certain communities. The Supreme Court also, le also endorsed racially restrictive covenants the same year that it upheld Euclidean zoning in the case of Corrigan v. Buckley. Um, what's a racially restrictive covenant? Well, here's a, an example of one. It reads, and this is something that would be filed with a, a real estate deed, um, which would restrict the use of property in some way. It reads, no persons of any race other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy any premises or any part thereof in said subdivision, except that this provision shall not prevent um, occupancy by domestic servants of a different race domiciled with an owner or tenant. So in other words, again, using the law to prevent um, immigrants and um, minorities from moving into more affluent white neighborhoods. Then after World War II, whites left the cities for the new sur suburbs with these racially restrictive zoning laws and restrictive covenants in place. Facilitated also by federally guaranteed mortgages, um, such as VA and FHA loans, made available only to whites, suburb expansion was reserved only for middle-class white people. Blacks and other minorities were relegated to a state of permanent, racially segregated rentership in urban areas, precluded from the American dream of home ownership, even if they could afford it. And you'll see down on your bottom right is a, a picture of a new subdivision that even advertises that the subdivision is exclusive and restricted only to whites. Although racially restrictive covenants are no longer legal, um, we still have zoning um, continuing to perpetuate this segregation. Uh, Single-family housing restrictions effectively prohibit apartment buildings and duplexes in, in areas where larger family homes are. Um, and so this uh, essentially precludes lower income owners to afford to live in certain neighborhoods because they can't um, you know, rent an apartment in those neighborhoods. Minimum restrictions on lot and home sizes also uh, preemptively segregate families who can afford large homes and big lawns from those who can't. Um, so again, we've got zoning law in place that is perpetuating the long-standing um, historical, racial, and economic segregation. Mm. Environmental injustice is truly a continuing problem. And as I'll discuss in more detail later on, generations of poverty and racism means that there is no meaningful access to the legal and political system for poor and, mi and minority communities today. Um, that's important to understand when you consider the, co the uh, concept of NIMBY, the NIMBY issue, not in my backyard. A successful uh, NIMBY case is really one that says, okay, you can dump in somebody else's backyard. And the effect of that is that the pollution gets dumped in the someone else's backyard who lacks the financial, legal, and political power to protect their own backyard. What about environmental laws? Don't they protect poor and minority people now? Well, the answer is really a resounding no, um, and for several reasons. The alphabet soup of environmental legislation and other laws have created extremely complex administrative processes that exclude people who do not have education and training in environmental law or the financial resources to hire lawyers and technical experts that do. As a result, more affluent communities are able to effectively use environmental laws to um, defeat those proposed locally unwanted land uses or LULUs causing industries to seek inexpensive land in low-income neighborhoods where people lack political and economic power um, to resist these intrusions. What about environmental regulatory agencies such as the federal US EPA or our own state Indiana Department of Environmental Management? 
Well, unfortunately, studies show that there's a substantial disparity between the government's diligent in enforcement and cleanup in poor and minority communities versus those efforts in affluent non-minority communities. In fact, the National Law Journal recently found in a report, or issued, uh, stated in a report that under RICRA, penalties were 500% higher in white communities than in minority communities that penalties under all the major federal environmental laws combined were 46% higher in white communities than in minority communities. Cleanups are slower in minority communities. Abandoned waste sites take 20% longer to be added to the Superfund cleanup program in minority areas versus those in white areas. And finally, in minority areas, EPA allows less permanent forms of treatment such as containment rather than actual cleanup of contamination. Compounding all of this, the residents of Gary Hammond in East Chicago have virtually no access to the legal system to address their environmental problems. And why is that? I think this is really critical to understanding the current problem. Nationally, there's approximately 30,000 environmental lawyers representing businesses and industry roughly 2,000 representing government agencies, and a mere 750 attorneys who represent nonprofit organizations, grassroots groups, and citizens for protection of the environment. In Indiana, there's just four full-time Indiana licensed attorneys uh, engaged in representing organizations and citizens in environmental matters. Of those four, only one represents actual citizens as opposed to organizations. And of course, these statistics do not include the wonderful work being done by um, uh, national and state and regional organizations um, not located here in Indiana, but nevertheless do work that benefits um, citizens here in the state. Overall, there's significantly more lawyers representing corporate and industry interest. So it really should be of no surprise that these interests enjoy significant advantage in forums where decisions that impact the environment are made. And although there are plenty of concerned citizens and environmental organizations in Indiana working to protect our environment, including HEC, there's not one legal aid clinic providing services to the residents of Gary Hammond and East Chicago in environmental matters. Also, Indiana's environmental nonprofits simply don't have the financial resources to provide the necessary counterbalance to industry influence and environmental decision making at all levels, including the legislative level, regulatory level, and our court system. Also interesting, um, when I was looking at the NGOs that do operate in uh, Lake County, 70% of those are religious congregations. The remaining 329 secular organizations, um, not one is engaged in addressing environmental degradation or EJ. So what's the solution? Well, considering this systemic problem, long-standing systemic problem, the only way to address it um, is to actually end the power imbalance by providing the citizens of Gary Hammond and East Chicago with the same meaningful access to technical, scientific, and legal resources as that enjoyed by industries operating near them. With meaningful access to these resources, citizens will be able to solve their own environmental problems by being able to effectively engage in the legal and political systems where decisions about the environment and land use are made. We're very excited to have received um, funding for a pilot project from the Legacy Foundation in Lake County and the Knight Foundation to embark on a project to demonstrate the efficacy of our environmental justice initiative, um, which is a real comprehensive three-pronged education, advocacy, and policy program designed to empower the victims of pollution in Gary Hammond and East Chicago to effectively assess, prioritize, and address the environmental threats that they face. And I'm going to talk about this three-pronged strategy in a little detail. The first is um, addressing the need for community-led data collection and analysis. Often, community complaints about emissions from an industrial source are typically met with denial by the source and government agencies that any exposure is really occurring. That's primarily because industry and government 
control the monitoring and play what I call the data game to downplay community concerns. The game is played by monitoring at the wrong locations, at the wrong times, for the wrong chemicals, with the wrong equipment. The, predict the predictable result of that is fun finding of no harmful contaminants, no harmful exposure that truly misleads the exposed population. Also, um, a study recently done in Texas by the Environmental Integrity Project found that 20 of the largest industrial facilities failed to report 80% of their actual emissions of regulated pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and smog-forming chemicals. Although no such study has been done that I'm aware of in um, Lake County or Gary Hammond in East Chicago, um, just the fact that industries do self-monitor largely and um, report their emissions, we can somewhat assume that actual emissions are, are oftentimes underreported. So how is the community supposed to know what they're being exposed to in order to address a problem? Well, citizens need to be able to test and monitor um, for themselves, their air and water for themselves. Traditionally, this testing has been very costly, but fortunately advances in science and technology have led to simpler and lower cost analytical tools for testing of air and water pollutants. An example of current nanotechnology is the solid phase micro extraction fiber, or SPME. The simplicity of using this um, allows the technology to, to be implemented by laypeople, enabling community ownership of the data collection. So the first phase of our pilot project is to train a Gary community group to conduct air and water testing using this technology in an area of concern that, that they identify as opposed to something that an outsider would um, be concerned about. Data will be analyzed by research scientists from Indiana University Northwest um, to determine the identity and quantity of pollutants. A toxicology analysis will be performed by a public health specialist from IU School of Medicine to further assess the effects of chemical exposures. So really um, allowing the community to um, lead and control testing of their air and water. The second phase of the pilot project will um, empower this community group with information and a specific strategy for effectively influencing industry and our government decision making to address the group identified contamination problem. Strategies, um, a strategy will be used um, through, or excuse me, I'm getting tripping up over my words. <laughs> a strategy could be community organizing, uh, coalition building, effective communication and media outreach, training in citizens' rights uh, to public information and participation. Um, they'll also understand what their remedies are under land use, zoning, open, uh, open government, and environmental laws. So one or all of these strategies um, will be discussed uh, and uh, will be helping the community to use them in order to address the specific problem that they identify. Now the ultimate goal of our environmental justice pilot project is to demonstrate that real systemic change can happen when impacted residents are able to engage in decision making at local, state, and federal levels over the long term. Meaningful participation in land use and zoning law um, really requires understanding though of complex legal issues and, proce and procedures as well as scientific and technical data and concepts. So over the long term, we really need to remove the economic barrier to the courts um, and experts. To that end, we hope that our successful pilot project and a comprehensive needs assessment will lead to sustainable funding for an environmental justice clinic that will serve the technical and legal assistance needs of the low-income citizens in Gary Hammond and East Chicago in environmental matters. So some closing thoughts. I think it's real critical to underscore that environmental justice is not just about racial discrimination, but it's also about chronic issues of class and income inequality. EJ is also not just about people versus industry, but it's really about people standing up for their quality of life in the face of systemic, long-term discriminatory land use, zoning, and environmental policies and practices. This also is not a political issue. 
This is a social justice issue. This is about helping people who are suffering, um, which should cross and uh, be compelling to both Democrats and Republicans alike. And I'll close by pointing out that our new Governor Pence in his inaugural address um, pointed out that Indiana should be number one in the country in quality of life. So I think that addressing this huge environmental justice problem should be a top priority for our governor and also an example of how this isn't a political issue. I thank you guys for your attention and uh, we'll open it up for some questions. Thank you, Kim, for your comments. And we, as Kim's mentioned, we're now in the Q&A portion of our time together. And uh, our first question comes from Nirupuma. And her question is, what is the source of the data being presented? Thank you for your question. Um, I have done some extensive research uh, into the conditions in, in Gary Hammond in East Chicago in drafting a uh, concept paper that we submitted to the Lake County Community Foundation as well as the Knight Foundation for their consideration. So there are multiple sources that support the data that I've discussed. Um, I'll add that if you are interested in a, in a specific um, piece of, of data that I talked about or a specific statistic, you can contact me and, I'm, and I'll happily provide the source to you. You're welcome. <laughs> the next question is, what is the name of the Gary Group participating in the pilot project? When will it begin? And how long will it take? Great question. Well, I'm really proud to be working with two groups. Um, one is the Calumet Project. Um, they have been working in Indiana for I think almost 20 years, as well as a, a newer organization called the United Urban Network, um, largely a, a Christian community group actually, um, that is also working to address EJ issues. Um, let's see the remainder of your question. What is the amount of the grant funds? Um, 25,000. We actually, at 20, let me correct that, 20,000 from uh, the Lake Community Foundation and Knight Foundation, as well as um, a private donor of private donation of $5,000 for the project. The next question is, could you talk a bit about HEC, how HEC is approached to reaching out to community residents? Are you working with existing community-based groups, which seems to be something you've touched upon in the prior question. Yes, yeah, we, we hope by, um, well, not we hope, we, we feel strongly that um, working with the community and empowering them to I identify in a meaningful way the problems that confront them and addressing them um, is really the only way to do this. This can't be an outside in. Um, it has to be a community uh, based effort. Can you tell us about when the pilot project will begin? Yes, we um, are actually starting it now um, and hope to finish by the end of this year. Um, it's a six-month pilot project that involves not only what I discussed during the presentation, but also a comprehensive needs assessment. One of the questioners asked about the city of Whiting and um, what was the reasoning for why it was not included in this pilot project? Well, um, so the, the funding is limited and we really had to focus on communities that we believe uh, had the most impact. Also, of course, we have um, a, a budding relationship with community groups in uh, the communities that we've identified. A, another person said, thanks for the talk. What are practical ways that NGOs can begin to converse about zoning laws and housing inequalities that keep the poor or minorities disenfranchised in their own communities? Well, I think that um, you, you certainly do that by becoming involved yourself in um, improving the zoning laws in your communities uh, to address not only the um, uh, zoning restrictions that, that prevent uh, poor and minorities from moving into quote unquote nicer neighborhoods, um, so more of a mixed use 
uh, promoting mixed uses, uh, you know, of housing types especially. Um, basically just getting involved. If you can get on your, your own county boards or uh, community boards and help make change, that, that can go a long way. And certainly voicing your opinions at those uh, meetings. Our next questioner asks, what is the most pressing, urgent environmental injustice right now in Lake County? I, I don't know what the most pressing one is. I think that the most pressing is the, the synergistic effect of all of them. There, there are just so many. It isn't just one, but the combination is what makes it so bad. Our next question is by, is by John, and he writes in, will the Environmental Law and Policy Center be involved in this project? We will be working with all of our good partners um, on this project. Uh, they have some great experience in environmental law and some good advice, and I'm sure that we will be reaching out to them uh, to help us along the way. Please continue to send your questions in through our comment our questions box on our webinar uh, software, or if you'd like, you can also tweet your question, uh, and our uh, Twitter handle is HEC underscore ED, and uh, please use the hashtag IN dash EJ. You can also write us in at comments at heckweb.org, or post on our Facebook page facebook.com forward slash H-E-C-W-E-B. Kim, as we wait for our next question, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe another couple examples of where we've pursued environmental justice work in other parts of the state. Oh, sure. Um, well, recently, as um, last summer, we uh, were successfully able to ensure that more than three million uh, tons of toxic steelmaking waste are properly managed and cleaned up at the ArcelorMittal Burns Harbor site. Um, although that's not directly in Gary Hammond and East Chicago, the um, pollution from that certainly impacts Lake Michigan and the um, recreational and drinking water resources for folks that live there. Um, another example of an EJ issue that um, I have been involved in, HEC has been involved in, is in empowering the um, a community group in the town of Pines to effectively participate in the um, circle of cleanup of a large coal ash landfill that um, has polluted and contaminated their drinking water for, for decades. Um, we brought our pursued legal action on the group's behalf and we were able to pursue $150,000 for the group so that they could hire their own uh, technical experts to uh, advise them through the um, RIFS, the Remediation and Feasibility Study for, um, that sort of looks at what proper cleanup um, measures will be taken. So that's an example. Um, okay. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, our next question is, how much of environmental justice as it pertains to race is more an issue of poverty? And then the questioner elaborates, do you find that environmental racism is part of the larger issue of affordable housing? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that the problem has historically been one of race that then perpetuated impoverished conditions that continue to exist to this day. Um, I know I provided some statistics that even currently um, you know, cleanups and enforcement are less in minority communities than they are in white communities, which does tend to demonstrate um, continued discriminatory decision making um, in in government. But you know whether that's intentional, that's that's a hard question, um, or whether it's just systemic continuation of what's happened over over decades. I don't know. That is a debate that's ongoing in the environmental justice. Uh, movement. Our next question is, how will you measure improvements, uh, in particular to quality of life and into, I guess, reduced racism? Well, I think this is one of those issues where it took a long time for conditions to get where they are. It is going to take a long time to see market improvement. So I, I would 
uh, reframe the question or think about the issue a little bit differently in looking first at helping um, the communities in Gary Hammond and East Chicago to effectively participate in the decision making, um, irrespective of the outcome of the decision making itself. I mean, at this point, they are effectively precluded because of their lack of access to attorneys and um, scientific experts. So I think providing that and that education, that resource, um, and actually demonstrating that they're able to effectively participate will be one of the first measures. Great. And as we wait for our next question, I'll ask you, Kim, um, are there any cities that you look to or any states that you look to as examples of ones that have exemplary programs for environmental justice? I know that California and Texas both, um, in Houston, there are um, large EJ communities, uh, as well as in, um, oh goodness, I believe it's Los Angeles um, in California where there are two um, really great programs that are doing a similar a similar program that we are or that we're contemplating doing um, and they, they seem to have had some, some success. Okay, well, we've had a number of qu questions emerge in the last couple of minutes. Uh, the, the first is, will there be a local office you can go to for assistance on environmental justice? Well, first, let me just remind the audience that we're talking right now about a pilot project. So this is not a done deal. The pilot project is all about um, demonstrating the efficacy and need of what we are envisioning. Um, assuming that that leads to broad funding then we would hope um, you know, part of that would be to have an office in the community where um, people are impacted. I will say that my, um, our HEC office in where I work out of in Valparaiso is there and I do certainly um, uh, am a little bit closer than our indie office to those communities and am involved in community groups in that area and do get calls from folks in that area. Someone's asked a question about the EPA and, and posed, how much EPA support is provided to distressed communities to undertake community action and cleanup efforts? Well, you know, the, the US EPA is actually subject to um, President Clinton's order um, to address and incorporate environmental justice in its decision making, as are all federal agencies. The problem with that <clears throat> is that many federal laws, in fact, most federal environmental laws are implemented and enforced uh, by the states, and the states do not have to and are not subject to that executive order. So um, the EPA, I, I believe, has, has made some effort, certainly under Administrator Jackson, that was a priority for her, uh, and, and she started a, a you know, sort of renewed the conversation again. but. Um, definitely more needs to be done to make sure that uh, EJ is addressed at the state level as well. Kim, a follow-up question from this same questioner is uh, really speaking to any uh, understanding you might have about what actually will trigger e the EPA to get involved. The question is particularly, what is the burden of evidence that must be produced before any such assistance is available? Well, I think, you know, what you see is that cleanups are as I, as I mentioned before, cleanup and enforcement is more vigorous in more affluent communities. And, and I think, and, and I'm thinking, this is really my own personal theory just based on um, my personal representation of poor and minority communities. Once these communities have a lawyer on their side, um, industry and government largely pays attention. And that's, that's kind of what's been missing is Having the, the resource there to rely on, whether it's actually used, um, is another question. But these communities don't have access to attorneys, uh, to lobbyists, to um, scientists and technical people to help them. And unfortunately, you know, government and industry really know that and, and understand that they can't fight back. Someone's asked the practical question about AGC's address in, in Valparaiso. Sure, 407 Lincoln Way, Suite A, 
Valparaiso 46383. And I think our, our address is on our website as well. Great. You know, this question has somewhat been addressed by some previous comments of yours, Kim, but I think it's worth posing again. Uh, are the polluting industries treated as adversaries, or are there efforts made to bring them on board as well? I, I think the latter has to be the case. Um, you know, as hopefully became clear in my presentation, this is a uh, decades-long systemic issue. So we're not calling out any one industry as being at fault for what's going on in, in these communities. And certainly, industries making change in their own practices and operations is essential and the key to improving environmental conditions and quality of life for these communities. So we hope that they will um, be on board with this as well. And we'll certainly reach out to them and not think of them as adversaries. Someone's asked, can one get access to these air monitors that you referenced, the solid phase micro extraction filters? Uh, yes, and, and you can just email me or call me. I, my email is kferraro at hecweb.org, and my office number is 219-464-0104. It's 12, 12.45 Eastern, and we still have about 15 minutes left for questions from you all, so please continue to right into our question box and or through Twitter at uh, uh, our Twitter handle HEC underscore ED and the next question is when there is an issue with industrial pollution and environmental justice is, is the issue of one of non-compliance or is it that the standards itself are too low? Well that's a, a fairly general question. Um, I think that in some instances with some types of pollution we certainly could strengthen standards, but given that most standards, unless they are applicable for example under the Clean Water Act to a specific water body um, like Lake Michigan where uh, water quality standards would be more stringent than say another body of water, you know, environmental standards are the same um, essentially for all communities. So then it comes down to enforcement of those standards. Um, the, other, the other issue, of course, is as I mentioned in the webinar, is the very high concentration of polluting sources in that area. So um, the synergistic effect of that, regardless of the standard, um, ultimately um, causes harm. As we wait for uh, further questions, okay, well, we do just have one that just jumped in. The person asks, I'm sorry, I should have been more specific. I am asking with reference to Lake County and environmentally distressed communities. I, I think it's probably largely an issue of enforcement. Great. Again, as we wait for more questions, uh, I want to again talk about EJ and, and the broader context in Indiana. What would you say see as kind of a live issue or a upcoming issue of environmental justice? Uh, maybe I'm uh, seeking you to talk about coal mining or coal ash issues for a second. Well, sure. I mean, the, it, as I said at the beginning, um, environmental justice issues um, exist throughout the country and throughout um, many cities here in, in Indiana. I mean, one need only look at the uh, CAFO issue, um, the concentrated animal feeding operation issue, to know that um, communities, uh, poor rural communities typically have the highest concentration of CAFOs and are suffering um, more than urban areas and, and folks that live in the city, obviously, that aren't living out uh, near these industrial livestock operations. Uh, coal ash ponds, um, which are devastating local waterways, um, are largely lo located in, in poor communities. To name a few examples, yeah. Please continue to pose your questions again by just typing in in the question box uh, on your panel, on your screen. We uh, don't feel shy. Great conversation.
Towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned Governor Pence's name, but I did not get the context for doing so. Will, will you repeat what you said about the governor? Sure. In, his, uh, in making the point that this isn't a political issue, um, I was referencing Governor Pence's inaugural address where he um, said that Indiana should be number one for quality of life. Um, given that that's the governor's goal for Indiana, that should be the goal for in all of Indiana's citizens, that all um, Indiana ci citizens, regardless of race and uh, so socioeconomic status, should, have, um, should be number one in their quality of life. Someone's asked a question about wetlands, and if you could please type your question again, that would be great. It looked like it was cut off. And again, so that we can be really sensitive to folks' time here, Kim, do you want to maybe briefly talk about the VIM uh, situation and how that interplays mm -hmm. with environmental justice? Yeah, I completely blanked on that when you asked me about some examples. Uh, we're representing a community of 1,700 people in Elkhart, Indiana. Um, Elkhart, as you may recall, back uh, when Obama first took office, was highlighted as a, an extremely impoverished uh, town, one of the um, uh, one of the worst in the nation. And um, this community has been home to a um, industrial waste recycler that takes in RV waste. Um, uh, biosolids from the city's wastewater treatment plant and other harmful um, waste and dumps it in large piles, open dumps it in large piles outdoors, grinds it outdoors without any pollution control and, and for decades has um, really terrorized this community. Um, so we brought legal action uh, a few years ago under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act um, as well as common law uh, trespass and nuisance. Uh, prevailed in taking that case to the Seventh Circuit and recently obtained um, class certification so that six representative plaintiffs can represent the entire community of 1,700 people. Um, as a result of that legal action, we are now pursuing a settlement um, to uh, end that community suffering. Okay, great. Um, another question is, Someone posed, please address involvement of local legislators. Are they supportive? Or I guess the question is, with respect to the Lake County EJ initiative, uh, when do state legislators enter into the conversation, do you think? Well, I think given that this is a, a pilot project first, um, given that the first stage is to help the community identify a problem, we need to see what the problem is that they identify before we can speak about the best way to go about addressing it. So I've given a broad overview of the issues facing this area, but the pilot project is going to be very focused, working with a small group of citizens, helping them identify a problem, helping them address the problem, and then doing a comprehensive needs assessment to make the case that this larger resource through an environmental justice clinic is needed. Now the questions are flowing again. Uh, <laughs> our next one is, do pollution monitoring devices log data into a central server? Are the individuals responsible for collecting data and reporting? Are you talking about, uh, let me just make sure I understand the question. Are you talking about the, the citizen data collection that we're proposing using the SPME fibers? And the answer is yes <laughs> from the uh, participant. Okay. So the, the SPME fibers are um, used in a way that citizens collect the data and then the fibers themselves will be given to the research team at IUN to do the analysis. When they've done their analysis, that information will be um, given back to the community. So no central database, although we certainly will be publishing and reporting on our findings. Great, and I want to remind everyone, we just have five minutes left for our webinar. We want to end on time, so please continue to write your questions and we'll try to address them as quickly as we can. Uh, another question posed had to do with 
the region versus the state, the fact that we've been spotlighting some communities in Lake County, which is, you know, co colloquially part of the region, and the person asks, is the region, is this in a region versus a rest of Indiana issue? How do you address this historical split? I don't view it as a region versus the rest of Indiana issue. We're, we're one state and the communities that are suffering here are Indiana citizens. We've just spotlighted this community because their suffering is so extreme. And again, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, that's not to diminish the suffering of other EJ communities throughout the state. Um, this just seems, um, this, this is just such a, a concentration of industry and so long standing um, that we felt compelled uh, to start there first. Great. Another question is, have you reached out to the State Department of Health or others who track health issues? We have reached out to any number of state agencies in the past on specific environmental issues that HEC works on, including the Department of Health. Um, but again, this is um, a brand new project for us that we just received funding for. Um, so in doing our needs assessment, um, we'll be looking at all of the various potential resources for this community, which would include um, local health departments, state and local health departments. So yes, we'll, in our needs assessment, be reaching out to them, out to them to see what services they may or may not provide. Okay. Someone asked, how can we listen to this presentation again? <clears throat> We're gonna plan to upload this presentation um, tonight and have it available for folks to view tomorrow morning on our YouTube web website, which again is youtube.com forward slash HEC web one. Someone asked, what can interested consumers outside of the area do to help HEC and its efforts? Jesse, you can answer that one. Well, I would <laughs> punt it to you. <laughs> no. There's many ways to help. Obviously, um, the most important is to stay in touch with us uh, and, and stay apprised of, of developments going on in Indiana through our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash HEC web or through Twitter, HEC underscore ED. Of course, we love the support, the financial support of um, our friends across the state and you can do so by going to HEC web dot org forward slash donate. Um, can I just add one thing to that, Jesse? Sure. I please. would say specifically if you're interested in helping with this EJ effort, if you have very specific um, expertise in um, environmental policy, environmental law, um, you know, in environmental science, toxicology, and you would like to um, volunteer some time to help with this, um, I'd really be interested in speaking with you. Great. Thanks, Kim. Um, just a couple couple minutes left. Someone's uh, just commented. Thanks for all the good for information you've given us, and your for your initiative. Will you give us an update on this project as it progresses? Absolutely. We'll be um, we'll be reporting on our progress um, frequently. Okay. We'll we'll have questions for just one more minute, and then we'll have just some final reminders to before we adjourn. So, final call for questions, please. Once again, um, really appreciate your time, uh, Kim Ferraro, our staff attorney, for your presentation and uh, best wishes in spearheading this uh, needs assessment uh, on behalf of HEC. Uh, once again, our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, August 29th at noon, and it's going to be focused on retrofits and renewables. It's, this is an opportunity to learn about uh, the state of incentives for clean energy in Indiana, both with respect to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And it will also be an opportunity to learn about a new legislative initiative called PACE. So we look forward to sharing that with you. We're going to have some excellent ec guest speakers for that webinar on August 29th. Once again, uh, this webinar will be available via YouTube tomorrow. We'll let uh, folks know through Facebook and Twitter. And I'm very grateful for your time and your compassion for uh, your fellow uh, Hoosiers. So with that, have a wonderful rest of the week and uh, we will talk to you soon.